evening worship service. It's good to see everybody out tonight. And uh, Brother Han is back with us. He'll have our lesson this evening. And we're glad that he was able to come and help us today and uh, always enjoy hearing his lessons. So uh, good to see those who weren't able to be here this morning are here tonight. Good to see Macon out tonight, back from her trip to rehab and <clears throat> so forth. So we're glad that she's able to be out and that Sharon's able to be out and others who may not have been here uh, earlier today. Um, uh, well, I just gave the sick list, so everyone else seems to be uh, doing well at the present time. Ed and, and Kara are out of town, as are Elbert and Blue Ann, so we need to keep them in our prayers as they travel. And there were three congregations this week, or within the near future, if not this week, um, they will be having some summer series, uh, West Side in Salem, Expressway, and Hebron Lane, and the flyers about those meetings are on the bulletin board there in the back. You get some more information from that. Remember, we're on week number 24 of our daily Bible reading. So uh, just two more weeks, and you'll be half over, right? 26 weeks. Um, so I encourage you to continue uh, participating in that effort. Uh, remember to put your checks on the uh, encouragement board when you invite folks to services. And uh, remember Brother Ping's report from First City and Vincennes is on the bulletin board in the back for you to check out tonight as well. Tonight after services, there are some cards in the foyer to sign, so make sure you uh, do that before you leave today. This evening, uh, Brother Ron will have her singing. I'll have her scripture reading, and it'll be from the 15th chapter of Luke if you'd like to be turning there. Um, uh, Brother Dennison will have our evening prayer. Uh, Jeff will serve those who uh, need to partake of the Lord's Supper. And at the proper time, Brother Han will bring us the evening message. Number 57 will be our first song. Number 57. All oh, people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, and serve with mirth His praise for the come day before Him and rejoice. Know that the Smite the living man. 
Read tonight from Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 11, and we will read through verse 19. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there he wasted the substance with riotous living and when he had spent it all there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want and he went out and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the tusks that the swine did eat and no one no man gave unto him and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no longer worthy to be called thy, ser- thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Let's all stand for a prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this. Another time we have to be together here to worship you as a congregation. We pray that everything we do and say here this day will be in accordance with your will. And we pray that by our being here, we might be strengthened and built up in your word. We give you thanks for all the many blessings we have in this life, especially the blessing that we have of your holy and divine word, which tells us what we need to do to to be good children of yours and have that chance of heaven. We also want to give you thanks for the blessings we have in this life, the material blessings that we have from day to day, our, our homes and, and just everything that you've given to us. We realize that all good things that we have are from you. And we're thankful for your son who you sent to this earth and he was willing to come and live that sinless life among men and set the example for us and was willing to go to the cross and be crucified, not for any wrongs that he committed, but for the sins of the world and that we might, by the shedding of his blood and we might have hope of forgiveness of our sins. And we at this time pray that you would forgive us of any sins that we may have committed. Since we've last called upon you, we pray that we would always try to understand when we do err from your word and that we would, uh, would always be willing to repent so we might stand justified in your sight once more. 
we pray for the sick that that we know of and the shut-ins and those in nursing homes that you would be with them all and, and bless them as you see fit for their needs and and we pray that they might have, have comfort at this time. And be with us throughout the remainder of this service tonight, throughout our lives, and we pray that heaven will be our home with thee someday. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Number 463. Time is filled with swift transition. No of earth on book can stand. Fill up your hopes of things in good to have this opportunity to be back with you this evening. I'm beginning to find out that uh, from talking to different ones that I have uh, a lot more knowledge of some of your family than I uh, realized for uh, when I first started coming here. Talked with Brother Dennison and he was telling me that Asking me if I knew his father, and I didn't know who his father was until he told me who he was. And I was very, very well acquainted with his father in those early days, about 63 years ago. And uh, so it begins to make you feel a little old, though, when you start talking about the knowledge of people that you had 60 and 63 years ago. But I have uh, such wonderful memories of those early days uh, in my efforts to, pre to preach the gospel and the brethren that I got to know and appreciate here in this uh, particular area. Uh, Brother Nail mentioned the Bible studies at uh, Westside beginning tomorrow evening, uh, Monday through Friday. We will have classes for the children, but Brother 
Mike Davis, who preaches over at Orleans, will be teaching the adult class uh, during uh, the series of meetings. It will be Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock each night, so we certainly extend an invitation to each and every one to come and to join us in that study this week. I'm convinced that Mike will do a good job and will be benefited by the study together. The reading there from uh, Luke, the 15th chapter, is a very familiar reading to Bible students. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son, as we sometimes, but as you study Luke 15, you find that it's not just an isolated parable. That really Jesus speaks three parables here, and it comes about as a result of the uh, scribes and Pharisees criticizing Jesus for associating with the uh, publicans and the sinners. And so he speaks three parables, one about a, a man who had a hundred sheep and uh, only one of the sheep was lost. <clears throat> and so he goes and searches and finds this one sheep and he finds it, and then there is rejoicing. And then he talks about a woman that had uh, ten coins, and he loses one, and she puts forth all this effort of sweeping to find that one coin, and she finds it. And again, there is rejoicing. And then in this particular parable that uh, Steve read uh, to us just a few moments ago, there's the lost son, and he's found. But instead of rejoicing as was done with the lost sheep and the lost coin, these Jews were like that elder son. They were mad. And that, that's really the main lesson of all three of these particular parables. That they were more concerned and had more... They would, uh, could understand the rejoicing over finding the lost sheep or finding the lost coin. But they were like that elder son. They uh, could not see the value of our, the rejoicing to be done when there was a, a soul that was found. And, and, but we'll have more to say about that in just a moment. But tonight, I just want to look at this one particular parable of the prodigal son. We've entitled the lesson, Four Steps to the Father. And I want to emphasize in the very beginning tonight that every person that is separated from God, that is separated from the Father, must take these four steps to come to the Father. Furthermore, I want to emphasize that when we get down to the last two of these steps, every one of us in this audience tonight is going to take one of them. But anyway, let's begin with the first one. As we read this particular story, here is a young man that goes to his father and makes a request and says that inheritance that comes to me, I want it now. The father does not argue with him. And instead, he gives them that uh, his inheritance. And he goes out and the Bible tells it that he spends it on riotous or prodigal living. And then it says that when he went and joined, uh, that uh, when he had spent all, verse 14, there arose a severe famine at that land, and he began to be in want. The inheritance is now spent. It's now gone. And now he takes that first step that we're going to talk about tonight. I refer to it as the period of observation. Now what I mean by that is, this young man has to see himself as he really is. And you know, this is true uh, with our spiritual condition. In, uh, individuals do not ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Until first of all, they recognize that they're lost. 
And so as we read there in these uh, verses, verses 15 through 17, he, uh, the Bible says he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the husk of their pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, I can remember years ago, Brother Harry Pickup Sr. held a meeting over at the old Park Boulevard congregation in Louisville. And he preached a lesson on this particular parable. He used this particular statement as the title of his lesson. He says, uh, uh, when he came to himself. What does that mean that he came to himself? For the first time now, since he has left his father's house, he's able to see himself as he really is. He, he's, he's spent all. It's gone. And nobody is helping. And so when he came to himself, he raised this question, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? So this is the first step that every person has to take. As, and, and as we go through the lesson tonight, let's each one of us take these steps. First of all, ask ourselves the question, how is my condition? We must see ourselves as we really are. How can we do that? I think uh, James gives us the answer to that over in the first chapter of the book of James. He talks uh, uh, in this particular uh, reading there in chapter 1, he talks about the individual who hears the word and does it not. And he says the individual who hears the word and does not do it, he's likened unto the man that beholds his natural face in the glass or in the mirror. And straightway he turneth away and forgetteth what manner of man he is. I guess maybe a lot of us would like to forget what we see when we look into the mirror. But James says, goes on to say, but whoever looks into that perfect law, that law of liberty, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh this man shall be blessed in his doing. So what I want us to see is if we want to see ourselves as we look, uh, really are, we need to look into uh, the uh, Word of God and look into it as though we were looking into a mirror. Because it is in the light of God's Word that we can see ourselves as we really are. And we can see ourselves in two conditions. It could be that as we examine our life and examine what we see in the Word of God, we can safely say, I've done that. This is what I believe. This is what I have done. As the Apostle Paul says there in Romans 8 and verse 1, that if, uh, in, uh, if uh, anyone is in Christ, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. We've been obedient to His will. We have done what He requires of us. And thus there's no condemnation. But sadly, if we're not in Christ, we find ourselves in the same condition as this young man. He said, how many servants in my father's house have bread enough and to spare? And I perish. I'm condemned. And so that brings us then to the second step that this young man had to make. And this is the second step that we must take when we examine our lives. There's only two possibilities. We're in Christ and doing what is right or we're doing what's wrong. As we observe our condition, that's the only two conditions that we can be in. And so that brings us then to the second step, what I refer to as the period of reflection. Now what I mean by that is, I ask the question, what happens if I continue as I am now? If I'm in Christ and am I faithfully serving Him? Oh, the answer is wonderful, isn't it? 
I have that hope. I have that hope of that home in heaven. On the other hand, if I am not in Christ, if I am not faithfully serving Him, I'm in the same condition spiritually as this young man was physically. I perish. You remember Jesus makes the statement in Luke 13 and verse 3 that except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Talking about those who were in need of repentance. And so if we're out of Christ, the answer is the same for us as for this young man. Spiritually, as it was for him physically, we perish. Now, if we have done these two things, and hopefully all of us have, and hopefully all of us would be in, in that group would say, well, I have demonstrated that faith that I have in Christ. And as we studied in our Bible study class this morning, I have that hope because of being justified by faith. And many people, when they talk about justification by faith, and Steve uh, very ably pointed this out in our class this morning, they, they don't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about. And they come to this conclusion, oh, well, since I'm justified by faith, I don't have anything to do. But really, if you want to just get down to it, the, the two positions that, Paul uh, is making there in the book of Romans is justification by faith as opposed to justification by a system of works or law. And as we studied there, in, uh, as he pointed out in Romans 3, Paul says that by works of law is no flesh justified. What does he mean by that? If you're talking about justification by a system of law, there's only one way that can be done. Perfectly keeping that law. I don't care what the law is. Now Paul uses uh, his uh, points there in the book of Romans. Oftentimes in reference to the law of Moses. But it doesn't make any difference what the law is. If all you have is the law and once you violate that law. There's only one thing that law can do for you. And that's say you're guilty. And really the person who is seeking to be justified by that system of law is doing what? Trusting in himself. I can do it. You know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I just don't know whether I'm doing enough. I can tell you right now. Whether it's me or whether it's you, we're not doing enough to merit or to earn our justification. I'll tell you what we can do. Quit putting your trust in yourself and your doing and put your trust in the one that made that sacrifice for your sins who's promised forgiveness upon certain terms and certain conditions and do what he says and demonstrate that faith that you have in him. And so justification by faith really means justification by a system of faith. Which means that we put our faith in something or someone other than ourselves. And when we put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, what does that mean? It means I trust Him. I believe what He says. I believe the promises that He has made. And when He says that here or something to be done in order to obtain something, like he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I demonstrate that faith by doing what he says. That's what it means to be justified by faith. And so now we reflect upon our condition. If we're in Christ, faithfully serving him, there's hope. But in this particular case, we have a young man that has not done what should have been done. 
And he now reflects upon his condition and said, look over there. All these servants in my father's house, they've got plenty to eat. They have bread enough and to spare. And look at me. I'm out here in the pig pen. And I perish. And so that brings us to an all-important step that he must take. That is, he must now make a decision. And this is what I emphasized a moment ago. Every one of us tonight, we're going to make a decision. Before you leave this building, you're going to, you're going to make a decision. It's very simple. Even as this year, I either, either stay as I am or I do something about it. Now, if we're faithfully serving the Lord, I say, keep on keeping on. As Paul exhorted the Ephesians, having done all to stand, what? Stand. But if there is something that is amiss in our life, I hope the decision would be like this young man. Look, look at what the Bible says here in regards. Beginning in verse 18. Look at the, the decision that he makes. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no more longer, no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hard servants as we look at that I would say that all of us would say this young man has made the right decision and like I've emphasized every accountable individual will make a decision the decision either to remain as he is or do something about it as we look at this young man now, he's taken these three steps. He has seen himself as he really is, separated from his father's house, out in the pig pen of... And keep in mind, this was about as low as a young Jewish man could go. The hog, the pig, was an unclean animal. Even the very thought of being around and touching made him unclean under the law. And so he realizes the condition that he's in and realizes what's going to happen if he remains in that condition. And now he's made a decision. A wonderful decision. But let me ask you a question. Where is he right now after he has made that decision? He's still in the pig pen, isn't he? So that means there has to be that next step. And that I refer to it as action. And proper action depends upon taking the previous steps that we've talked about. I do not believe that a person can take the proper action without doing the proper observation of his condition and reflecting upon that and making the right decision. So many times I've talked to individuals and they will agree that what has been presented to them is what the Bible teaches and you get a reply something like this. Someday. I'm going to obey. Someday. You know I've looked at several calendars through the years. And I've never seen someday on any of them. Until we act upon that decision. We're yet in our sin. We can believe that Jesus is the Christ. We can realize that the decision is to be obedient to His will, to be in Him and to receive the forgiveness of our sins is what needs to be done. 
but until such time as we act upon that knowledge and act upon that decision, we're still in the pig pen of sin. Going back to our Bible study class this morning, we spent time there in the book of Galatians. And Paul has established the fact that though the law was given a long time, 400 years after the promise was made to Abraham that in his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed, there were two truths in regards to that. Number one, the law did not fulfill the promise. But the second point he makes is the law did not annul the promise either. That promise was still in effect and shows that it is in Christ Jesus that we are the children of God by faith. If you look at verse 26 of that third chapter of Galatians, wherefore if, uh, if, if we're in Christ Jesus, we are the children of God by faith. Sometimes people read that passage there in verse 26. He says, we're the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That is, we're the children of God by having faith in Christ Jesus. Well, that's necessary. But that's really not what the passage says. What the passage says is that it's in Christ Jesus that we are identified as the children of God by faith. Now I need to find out how do I enter into that relationship that Paul refers to as being in Christ? As Brother A.C. Grider used to say, read the next verse. For as many of us as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. And so he tells us how we enter into that relationship that he refers to as being in Christ. Now, this young man acts upon the decision that he has made. Beginning in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'm convinced if this young man had been like many that I have seen through the years, at this particular point, he was, oh, man, this, this may not be as hard as I thought it was going to be. Look at how glad he is to see me. Look how glad that he is to see me come back. Maybe I won't have to do what I decided to do and tell him I'm just not worthy to be his son. Maybe I can just step back in and act like nothing has been done. You know, I think I've seen that on the part of some. Here are individuals that have been unfaithful. They stay away from the, uh, the Lord for a long period of time. And then they show up. And those who have been faithfully serving the Lord are so thrilled and so glad to see them to take that step of coming back and they uh, let it be known how thrilled they are to see this step that they have taken. And I, they get the idea, so, hey, well, maybe that's not going to be so rough after all. Maybe I'm not going to have to admit all the wrong things that I've done. Maybe I can just step back in and take over where I left off. No, you know and I know this young man didn't do that. This young man continues on even after his father shows this compassion. In verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no, more, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. How wonderful up to this point. 
But then the lesson that Jesus was teaching comes to light. These Jews that had criticized Jesus for associating with sinners are like this elder son. But he was uh, talking about uh, uh, verse 26. So he called, this is talking about the elder son. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He hears the, uh, the merrymaking. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him ate safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. He would not go in. Why would he not go in? Oh, his brother who had spent all of his inheritance on riotous living was in there. But you know what? His father was in there. He would not go in to, even to his father. So he answered to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this son of yours, no, he, he says, this son of yours, he didn't say my brother. He said, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your in livelihood with harlots, and killed the, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You see, he was more interested in receiving the goat than he was in being in fellowship with his father. But stop and think about this and how simple this particular lesson is. This is a lesson that every individual can teach to friends and neighbors and point out to them the four steps that they have to take. First of all, they have to see themselves as, as they really are. This is something that we often overlook. I've heard people make the statement, oh, we need more teaching and preaching that would convince men and women what they need to do in order to be saved. I'm not so sure that's what is needed. I'm convinced that we need more teaching and preaching that will convict, convict individuals of their sin and make them realize they need to be saved. Let me give you an example. The very first gospel sermon preached in fact. Peter, there on the day of Pentecost. The apostles began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we find two groups in that audience. We find one group that is, <laughs> those men are drunk. And you know, Peter doesn't spend much time with them. These men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. Basically, all he says is, this, that's not so. But there was a second group that asked a very simple question. What meaneth this? What's this all about? And Peter begins there in about verse 16, I believe it is, in answering their question. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes on to show how David had spoken of these events and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. And then in verse 36, he brings it to a conclusion. Let all of the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. So here's some 20 verses as we have it recorded of Peter convicting these individuals of their sin and saying, you're guilty. Having done that, the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts and then they asked that question, what shall we do? And so now people who recognize where they are having crucified the Son of God, 
one verse. And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. All these verses, and again, I'm simply using what we have recorded. We know that more was said than what we have recorded. But some 20 verses convicting these individuals of their sin and saying you're guilty. And once they recognize and see themselves as they really are, remember observation. Okay, what shall we do? They've got a decision to make. And Peter says, you repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And Luke tells us that those that gladly received his word were baptized and there was added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. And so that's what needs to be done today. People need to recognize if they are not in Christ or if they are unfaithful in Christ, they need to repent. And those outside of Christ need to be baptized into Christ. Remember what Paul said there in Galatians 3.27? And those who are in Christ are like Simon there in Acts 8. He believed he was baptized, but he sinned. And what, what did Peter say? Repent and pray God that the very thought of your heart would be forgiven. So as I say, we're t- going to make those de- uh, decisions. And the de- it's very simple. I'm either going to remain as I am, which if we're faithfully serving the Lord, I hope that's the decision we make. But if there's anything that is amiss in our life, We need to go to God's word and find out what I need to do and then do it. If you're outside of Christ, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repent of your sins, confess that faith, be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you've done that but you haven't been faithful in your service to the Lord, you've got a decision to make. Do I do something about it or do I remain as I am? What's going to happen? If I remain as I am, I'm not faithfully serving the Lord. Depart from me. I never knew you. But it can all be changed, just like it was for Simon. I can repent. And I can pray to God, and he's promised to forgive. And you know, there are three words that we need to remember about God. It's found more than once. I I usually refer to 1 Corinthians 1 and 9. But these three words need to be impressed upon our minds to the point that we never forget them. God is faithful. When I have his promise, and when I have the terms and the conditions of that promise, I can be assured that when I do what he tells me to do, that I'll receive the promise that he has given. I don't have to doubt. Man may make a promise to you, and he may or may not keep that promise. Men sometimes can be unfaithful in their promises. But you remember those three words. God is faithful. You don't have to doubt him. So if you have reflected upon your condition, and you've made a decision that you need to do something, to be right with God. I hope that you'll make that known right now as together we stand and sing the song that's been announced. God is calling the prodigal come without delay. Hear, oh, hear him calling, calling now for thee. Though you've wandered so far from his presence, come today. Hear his loving voice calling still. Oh!
house with thy father and to spare. He will hear him calling, calling out to thee. Lo, the table is spread and the feast is waiting there. Hear his loving voice is calling still. Calling now for thee. Lord's table is left prepared for any who did not have opportunity this morning to partake. If you wish to be served this evening, please raise your hand. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this memorial that's been established to help us to remember and to look back to that scene on the cross where Christ was willing to go, where he died for us and where we have the hope of forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the love and the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And we thank you now for this loaf and how it represents the body of Christ. Pray for those who are partaking and might do so worthy to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Again, Father, we come to you and say thank you for this memorial, for this emblem that represents the blood that Christ was willing to shed there on the cross for us. We thank you for that sacrifice, for that love, and we thank you for uh, the opportunities that this presents for us. Thank you for this memorial in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anyone wish to lay by in store at this time?
Thank you, Brother Han, for coming our way today and presenting two lessons from God's Word. We appreciate that. Thank you for your efforts. Uh, remember, there are cards to sign as you're leaving the building. Are there any additional announcements to make? If not, after the closing song, Greg, will you lead us to dismissal prayer? Please stand. Number 106. Number 106. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, if I have walked in my own willful way, dear Lord, forgive. Thank you.